hectic weekend and uh, it's great to get up and, and see what was going on at the weekend and some brilliant stuff and great to meet everyone. So yeah, buzzing at the moment, mate, buzzing. Yeah, it was it was a wicked weekend. I mean, I was just really kind of pumped for it to start with, but at the end, I was it was a I actually had a bit of a come down on Monday. I was like, you know, shit, I need to get some sleep here because it's uh, it's it's killed me, man. <laughs> but uh, Monday morning, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I was disappointed. I could only stay for one afternoon. I'd love to have uh, done the whole weekend and got out and had a few beers with everyone as well. But unfortunately. Uh, Duty called and I have to get back for for work. But next time, uh, mate. Next time, it's all good. Yeah, yeah, definitely, mate. Definitely. Well, let's let's crack on. So we've got some questions here, and the first one actually relates to the session you and I did last week, Lawrence, and it's from Phil. And um, in relation to the program design stuff, Phil says here. <clears throat> if you're using a two or three day program. Will you work the same muscles and movements on consecutive days? If so, would you use different rep ranges, etc., to allow there to be a difference in stimulus in order not to disrupt recovery? For example, squats one day, then deadlift the next day may or may not disrupt recovery. Obviously, a solution is upper lower, but the three-day program you, you showed, Brendan, as was whole body, so I wondered, as that wouldn't fit into a week, and a possible, I know it's a long question, a possible solution to the above question might be Russian conjugated sequence. And have we any opinions or thoughts on that? So, I mean, I'll let you have a think about that because I know it's the first time you've, you've heard it, Lawrence. But um, I think for me, the, the two and three day program is going to be, from an athletic strength perspective, always going to be based on total body sessions uh, and I say always there's an exception to every rule but generally speaking that's the way I'd go and in terms of recovery well that's all about exercise selection intelligent exercise selection so I think if you're going to do heavy squats one day then you need to have a little bit of recovery time and, and allow that the body to recover fully or, or adequately before you stress them in a similar movement pattern again. But that then comes down, as I say, to, to, to intelligent exercise choice. So the model I showed with the programs in there is, is going to stay the same, but the exercises that you choose can be slightly altered. So it might be that day one hip dominant or day, day one knee dominant strength might be front squats. Day two the major strength exercise might be a hip dominant stiff leg deadlift or or, uh, or deadlift. So you, you're apportioning the soreness there uh, adequately between them. And I think ultimately that's my philosophy is it these two and three day programs, it is genuinely about managing soreness appropriately. And that's why I like to use exercises like front squats versus back squats and stiff leg deadlifts a lot versus traditional deadlifts certainly initially because they 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 provide a stimulus that 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 doesn't conflict with each other so for example when i do front squats i get a lot of anterior recruitment and when i do stiff leg deadlifts i get a lot of posterior recruitment and that means i can condition and strengthen those areas well without any crossover whereas if i did back squats and uh, trap bar deadlifts there's a big, big crossover there, and you just end up piling on more soreness. So before an individual's conditioned or trained for for that soreness, as 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 you get more experienced and you you're able to to deal with that and cope with it, then you can play with that a little bit more. But generally speaking, I wouldn't. You know, it's all about intelligent programming, and um, and then on your third day. You might have a single leg or a unilateral exercise as the main strength exercise. So you've you've ticked all the boxes across the week. Every every session is doing everything. You're pushing, you're pulling, you're, you're doing knee dominant and hip dominant, but you can mix up unilateral and bilateral exercises so that the soreness is managed effectively. And then as your athletes become more conditioned, you can um, introduce more exercises or higher intensity on specific exercises or exercises that 
might have a, a slightly, I guess, I guess more crossover. Um, I might have rambled on there, but Lawrence, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think some uh, some good points there, Brendan. I mean, the other way of doing it is, I mean, I don't know if you're talking about pure strength in terms of like a block of strength, or again, if you're looking at sort of what I think you said, conjugated approach, really, where you're, you're working across the curve within a week. Um, so, you know, you can train with maybe different loads at different velocities on different days. Um, so, again, an example I'll give from our or sort of my environment, really. So, if we have lads play on a Saturday, um, come on a Monday, they're still going to be a little bit fatigued there from the game. So, we might do um, a light lower body session or a whole body session, rather, which will be more sort of emphasis on unilateral, maybe a little bit of strength stability, um, activation type stuff, generally quite low loads just to almost get everything firing up and, and get some blood circulation going. Um, Tuesday, then, we might have our, our strength day, so we'll crank up the intensity and maybe drop the volume a little bit. And then Thursday will be a lot more dynamic, so we might do some um, sort of speed strength, some plyometric work and some power work on a Thursday um, and tend to sort of split it up that way as opposed to having sort of three heavy days throughout the week, um, yeah. which I find tends, tends to work for us um, quite well. So... Um, yeah, again, whether it is alternating the exercises, if you're still having a sort of strength, like what you said, Brendan, a strength emphasis, or whether you sort of want to undulate your week a little bit, um, so you sort of have a sort of dynamic day, uh, a heavy day, and then a lighter day as well, um, which is the way I tend to work it, and that works quite well for me, really. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point, and um, it's something. It's certainly an approach I've used a lot with in-season programs. We've had a, a strength day earlier in the week and a power day closer to the weekend um w within that power session i'm still gonna get some load in there and um but it but again i think that's still about choosing the specific exercise intelligently so it, it works the right areas and, and doesn't just add to the stress from the tuesday th the tuesday session so we with the with the the rugby league boys for example our our first session of the week would be a heavier strength session second session of the week would be a a power session and then within that power session we'd have some speed power some ballistic power and some explosive i guess explosive strength stuff sort of 60 to 80 percent type loads but we wouldn't really go mega mega heavy on that one and we'd we'd let we'd, we'd stress them in that side of things on the on the first session um similar to you is that with the football guys yeah, definitely, mate. Like I said, we might, again, like you said, have a bit of variation on a Thursday with, with the type of sort of speed or power exercise we're using. So, like you said, Brent, we'll maybe have uh, one exercise, which is which is a heavy power exercise, which might be a, some sort of mid-fight pull or a particular movement like that. And then we might have some body weight sort of reactive jumps or some box jumps or single leg jumps towards the end of the session as well. So, um, again, we sort of do work across different spectrums of power, but... Obviously, we tend to go for the sort of less fatiguing stuff if we're getting lads yeah. um, heavy squatting or heavy deadlifting towards the end of the week. Um, they're still going to be feeling that on the match day, um, mm. and they're still going to have that bit of fatigue in there. So, try and sort of keep the fatigue, the heavier fatigue stuff to an early on in the week. And yeah. I say Thursday is more about sort of just um, priming up really and getting those sort of explosive movements in there. And it, and it, I think in general, it's it's come that it does come down to minimal dose response as well, and, and knowing who you're working with and. You know, don't don't do don't do five sets if you can get away with even two sets or three sets certainly. So when we when we're bringing groups back in um, for pre seasons, the emphasis might be on work capacity, general strength type stuff, but we're not smashing them with five sets of five. It's just maybe a couple of sets of eight to ten on the first two or three sessions, and then three sets of six or three sets of five on the next four or five sessions and just, just getting getting people in and getting them used to training again. And I think if you look at minimal dose response, intelligent complementary exercise selection, then you, you can you can manage that soreness pretty effectively and then switch into possibly an undulating model like we've just discussed for an in season approach works pretty well. Yeah, no definitely man. I think again like you said it, it does depend on the athlete uh, their sort of training experience, their training age, yeah. and their sort of competition schedule as well. Like you said, in, in season, obviously, you want to keep that volume to a minimum. So, um, yeah, we tend to not work above anything above three sets in season, really. And like I say, if we can, 
sort of two sets really, especially on a Thursday. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so that's that's good. We we covered that one. I'm just going to look for um, some of these other questions. Have you got any of those questions in front of you, Lawrence? I have here. Yeah, do you want me to? Do you uh, want to fire one or two of them out then? Yeah, see where we go with it. Um, so from actually, this is from a couple of my guys down in uh, Cornwall High Performance, uh, which was Rob Smalden. Um, so this is a question: CHP are working with a team of six rowers. Um, fixed seat, but their indoor work is concept two, ergonometer work <coughs> and sliding. Just need some advice on force production and power. I'm thinking it's predominantly concentric, low level reactive, as feet are fixed and always have contact. Seated box jump and dumbbell hang snatch are my thoughts. Max strength phase is in place now, times two full body sessions per week. Um, that was sort of that was one A, and there was a one B that goes with that. So maybe we should. Uh, Try and answer that before we go to the second part of the of the question. Mm, yeah. I don't know if you, you want to start that one off with Yeah, to, yeah. Well, I think one. having worked with rowers and um, in the past and um, kind of experienced their culture, I think they they um, they do tend to understand strength training, but they don't always get the max strength side, and so I think that's probably what. Rob's hinting on on the the force production and the power side of things, um, and I think what I, what I would say there is, just because they they they're in that position and they push in the boat or in in that way doesn't necessarily mean that we should purely just replicate that in training. Um, so I think like the philosophy I would say is you you know you got to build an athlete before you uh, build a, a rower so to speak. So. Getting them, getting them strong and powerful in, in, in multiple planes of movement is not a bad thing at all because rowers, in my experience, tend to be very, very adapted to what they try and what their activity. So I remember putting them through little circuits where we had them running through ladders and jumping over hurdles and it was, it was literally hilarious to watch because the guys just could hardly put one foot in front of the other. And um, and and they weren't afraid to to laugh at themselves as well. They 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 literally had very little coordination out out of the boat at all. And I, and so I think that's that's our job to to expose them to those things, and give them some give them some stimulus and create that adaptability. Um, so I I I did a lot of different power exercises. I did a lot of jumps, uh, a lot of cleans and snatches, but also some body weight stuff, some cable twists and turns and things like that. And then um, force production, I think your, your key exercises for uh, for rowers essentially is going to be your squatting variations, your deadlift variations and your single leg work as well. So that, that you're getting uh, a balanced program in there. Dumbbell hang snatch. Yeah, fine. You know, you can do barbell snatches. You can do whatever works for them. But um, I think they they do need to have a decent amount of load on there because that those first few strokes out the blocks in in the boat are, are pretty strength speed type movements. Um, so you certainly need to to work the curve in that way. Um, yeah, I think seated box jumps would be good. Um. Yeah, that's kind of that's what I'm thinking. What do you, what do you reckon, Lawrence? Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think as well. Obviously, you know, you can apply this to rowing or, or many other sports, but fundamentally, it does come down to an element of being able to produce force. Um, so, whether how you manage to get to that sort of final outcome is obviously can be quite similar. So, like you said, you, your big strength and power exercises. You know, you're going to get a, a transfer there, which sort of answers, I think, a little bit of one B of his question. So. You know, the stronger you can get your athlete, whether it, you know, in this case it's the rower, then that's only going to should have a positive transfer into their sport. Um, I would have thought, obviously, again, I'm not experienced like you with, with rowers, Brendan, but um, obviously the lower body stuff's important, but probably the upper body side of things there as well. Um, in, the, in the rowing activity and or rowing action, also sort of like trunk stabilization, obviously, uh, would be quite important. Um, it says here two body, full body sessions per week, so. Again, I know obviously when you start going on to, uh, from my personal experiences, 
Um, you're going on to dumbbell snatches and, and snatches and things like that. They're obviously a little bit more technical. Um, so if you have got limited time, then there, there might be sort of more simple and effective um, exercises to use to maybe to get that sort of force generation, really. Mm. Uh, like I said, with my lads, we tend to just use a lot of pulls um, from different positions. And we can you can load them really heavy. Um, so I'm really getting a good like, power output while they're performing the exercise. And they're, they're really straightforward to teach as well. Um, yeah. So I would tend to start with, with some of those just pulling movements um, and squatting exercises um, before you progress maybe onto sort of the more technical stuff. Mm. Um, so mm. I find you can spend weeks and weeks just teaching them sort of sound, sort of technical efficiency, and you that's time you're losing to actually get them stronger or more powerful. Um, so I'd go back to sort of the principle of trying to keep it simple, really. Um, but again, mm. I don't know the sort of training background and, and history of the, these rowers. So, yeah, I think uh, I suppose might, you're going to have to take that, weigh that up with who you're who you're working with and what how much time you've got with them and what they've done before before you make that exercise selection of course and uh, I think you're right though I think it's um, you, you've got to get the guys strong um, what 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 I found with a lot of the rowers is they're quite well they they do they have a lot of them have actually done a bit of lifting before and. Um, very often they, they sort of think that they've got a good understanding of what's required, but then when you ask them what they're doing, they'll, they'll be doing like 40 reps of uh, high pulls with with 40K. And I think like a lot of that is kind of, well, we it's this many strokes for a 2,000 metre, so we're just going to replicate that in um, in, yeah. the, in the weights room. And I, I, had a, I had guys when I first went and started work, working with rowers, they were doing a circuit which consisted of 40K on the bar, that's that's it, and uh, it was I think it was forty reps of high pulls, forty bent over rows, forty squats, and forty stiff leg deadlifts, and wow. um, you can imagine what that looked like. Uh, it was it was it was hideous. It was absolutely hideous. And so uh, you know we we I quickly changed that and, and chipped away. But um, some of the stuff that that I did get onto with rowing that that worked pretty well was was actually some some longer kind of postural holds and some work on making the right shapes for for their positioning in the boat because a lot of the guys have got quite tight hamstrings or posterior chain flexibility and when they're reaching really far forward they talk about applying force well they're applying force but they're applying force through their back because they're not flexible enough to engage properly in that bent position so we started getting into a lot of wall-based holds that I was working up uh, to, to kind of minutes at a time, three to five minutes, but cueing them to, to, to hold their positions and get their chest out. And really it was, it was posterior chain lengthening work while with, a, with the attention to detail on the, the trunk position so they could actually produce force effectively. Um, so that that was quite good, but I think um, you know, like you say, Lawrence. It, ultimately, it, it's keeping it simple, and you know, it's it's strength first, and uh, work on getting the getting the speed and the power in there with with your bog standard basic exercises. It's nothing more than 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 most sports when it comes to that, really, is it? Yeah, no, hundred percent agree with you. And uh, like you said, I think again, when you look at your sort of needs analysis, if you get a chance to to screen any of these rowers. Um, obviously what you might identify for one might be different for another so again obviously you're going to have your sort of general sort of template there but it might be a case of where you put one or two um, individual <coughs> exercises in for each rower if there's anything specific that they need to like Brendan said if there's a sort of hamstring mobility or flexibility issues there or you know trunk, trunk stability exercises if they're getting a lot of sort of rotation um, through the row they might need some extra sort of anti-rotational trunk work or you know just examples but try and tailor a little bit. I know you can't be, you know, each program can't be totally specific, but if you've got some general sort of strength and power development work in there, uh, maybe one or two individual sort of accessory um, exercises for the rowers would probably go down quite well in yeah. terms of buy-in as well. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, well, hopefully that kind of answers the first part. I know uh, still with me, Brendan. The, the guys are doing a good job down there. Yeah, sorry, I'd, mute, I'd muted uh, muted it by mistake there. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers the first part anyway. But um, 
I know uh, the guy, Sam's listening in, so if there's anything else, Sam, that you want us to touch on there uh, with the rowers, give us a shout. And, and do you want to go on to part two, Lawrence? Well, I think we have sort of touched on it a bit, Sears. Also, uh, also our full spectres of consideration, row is, rowing is horizontal force and our plan is training using vertical force. Or am I just confusing things? Um, so I, feel, I think you've sort of touched on that, Brendan, um, when you talked about sort of joint positioning and, and joint angles and stuff, which is obviously not necessarily position specific. Obviously, if you look at something like a squat, uh, where you're looking at sort of hip and knee extension and you're using those specific muscle groups, it's the same sort of position, I suppose, when, you, when you're rowing anyway, isn't it? So you're going to get that transfer across. Yeah, you're going to get that transfer and, you know, just train what you see. You know, that that's it. It's... Uh, Let's keep it simple there and a high pull, a squat, um, any kind of bent over movement, bent flexion to extension is going to transfer well to rowing because those guys spend a lot of time in the boat anyway and um, you, you're going to get a lot of technical crossover that we don't necessarily need to play around with anyway. Um, they, they, they're going to they're gonna get that adaptation from the technical stuff so... We just need to get them moving well, producing force well, and uh, not complicate it too much. I think is the is the message there. So, yeah, agree uh, with that, Brent. Agree with that. All right, next one. What have we got next? Um, I've got one from Steve Cronshaw here. He says, um, "I'm coaching <coughs> a number of cyclists by internet with programs, but feel it's lacking that face to face contact." Um, in brackets, it's not about the sets and reps. I talk on the telephone and ask them to post videos of technique on some lifts. I see them say three or four times a year. Do you have any other suggestions to get to better understand than me? I suppose Skype is one area I should be doing. One of the riders doesn't like talking by phone. Um, so I'm okay. guessing what he's saying here is that um, obviously lack of contact time where with the cyclist seems to be the issue. And is there any way maybe that he can improve um, what they're doing by sort of, I guess, phone or internet or, or any other sort of methods that you can recommend? Well, I think um, Skype Skype's good because you can share your screen there or, and you can what kind of chat face to face. So, you know, there's a there's a direct connection there straight away. But I think other things you can look at is get him to get him to send video of, of what he's doing and um, you can then see him moving effectively, number one. But then also you could send, you could when you talk it or when you're giving him feedback, rather than typing it in an email or um, just kind of you know feeding back via text or you know typing the answer, re record your answers and do like a screen capture. And when you've written the program, you could actually talk them through the program on um, and record yourself doing that and send them a, a five minute video of how to do it and why you've chosen what you've what you've chosen for them and the rationale and that'll just help to get a bit of engagement a bit of buy-in from them when they're when they're listening to it i know a lot of the golf coaches do that when they do like swing swing feedback they kind of capture it on a camera on a, a an audio and then the the player can actually see what they're doing uh, and why they're doing it and get some feedback on that and so you, you can make the adjustments there rather than just fi firing a video back so when you when you get the the critique back from the athlete you can you can make observations and send that back to them and, and slow it down using something like coach's eye or, or, or one of the other apps uh, and the same when you're written your program and just give them a little bit more buy-in off the back of that and um, and if you can get them together for camps and, and things like that, great. Or maybe you've got people in the area, network, you know, coaches that you know do a good job and they can tap into them and, and just, you know, cast cast their eye over them if you if you trust them and and they've got the expertise required. Um, and just, just let them have a, some interaction there as well. Um, what about you, Lawrence? Anything? Anything you've got? Yeah, I think you touched on the coaches either. That's, that's an app that I use quite frequently. Um with the players that do actually have an interest in and have a bit of buy-in. And uh, what we tend to do is if we're in a session, we might video some of their stuff, we'll give them a little bit of feedback in the session. I know that's easier because I have contact with them. Uh, but what we tend to do as well is, is we can WhatsApp um, things over to them. So 
if we want to show them, for example, a squat or, or something they were doing or an exercise they were doing in the gym, um, like I say, you can put your little lines um, to show where the position they're in and what position they should be in. You can put voice over the top of it. Um, I send them just a three or four minute little video there and it's like straight, it's instant feedback. Yeah. Um, and then sort of when you, when you, when they come back into the gym, it's easier for us to sort of say, look, obviously saw the video, you know, you know what you should be doing in today's session and it's easier for them to sort of visualise what they're doing. Um, I appreciate obviously you don't get the contact side of it, but I'd say to definitely get a um, coach's eye out. That's a, that's a great app, um, mm. really easy to use. And I so say you can just take short videos and, and either email or WhatsApp them um, over to your cyclist. So, yeah, no, I agree with you on that one, Brendan, definitely. Video, video is the way forward, I think, and, and trying to sort of get the voice across and, and the images across that you want. Yeah, cool. Hopefully that, that'll give you some uh, tips there, Steve, and you can have a play with some stuff and you can always set up a, a Facebook group or a, a portal type arrangement for them to, to reach you on a more regular basis too. That's pretty pretty, pretty easy and straightforward to do. Um, okay, I've got a question here from Francis. What's the shortest amount of time you would leave between an on-pitch conditioning session and a gym-based session? And from that, what would you then advise would be the optimal amount of time to leave between sessions, if possible? Also, would this depend on the different physical qualities being trained on the pitch, anaerobic, aerobic, and in the gym, power, strength? Um, I think that's it. Yeah. So, go for it, mate. Yeah, let me, let's see what you've got to say. Francis, one of my guys, again, I know he's, uh, he's football, so um, hopefully yeah. I can put a good slide on that. Um, yeah, obviously a good question. And uh, obviously, if you look at a lot of the research out there at the moment and <clears> looking at the sort of mixed signal you might get from training aerobically and strength training um, within a short period of time, so it's a very good question. Um, I think, yeah, for me, it's working within the, the real world constraints of what you've got. Um, ideally, you know, you, if you're training aerobically, for example, in the morning, um, that's a football specific session, um, and there's a sort of high aerobic demand. Obviously, you want to give yourself as much time as possible um, for a complete a strength session. So it might be a case of a, a football session in the morning and then a strength session sort of late afternoon or early evening. Now, I know in my um, sort of where I'm working, it's quite difficult to, to allow that sort of period of time. Um, as players as they are in nature, they just want to get in and get out of the building as quick as they can. Um, so I tend to work on if we have a, a high, depending on the intensity of training in the morning, will depend on how much time I sort of give a break before the afternoon. Um, so generally, if, if it's a really light session, if it's more of like a technical session and it's only a light aerobic stimulus, um, what I'll tend to do is maybe give them a, a 15, 20 minute break, uh, make sure they get a good. Uh, you know, so a good recovery shake or something in between, hydrate, um, and then get them in the gym. If it is a much more sort of high intensity demanding session in the morning, um, I know it says here you know, aerobic anaerobic tend to be when you play football. Yeah, you know we talked about it at the weekend. You, you don't just train one energy, energy system; uh, you sort of train them all. So if it's sort of if it's a demanding sort of energy system session, then I'll tend to try and give them a good 90 minutes to two hours recovery between sort of the morning session and the afternoon strength session. Um, and ironically, on a, on a Thursday, I actually switch it around. I actually do my power session, um, if it's a power session on a Thursday, actually before they train in the, in the morning session. So they tend to maybe come in the gym at 10 and do their power session, and they might go out and train at half 11. They might have a little bit of video analysis in between. Um, so I find that works quite well because... On a Thursday, if they've they had a bit of an extensive session and then you want to do power, um, they might still be a little bit fatigued and uh, you won't get the most out of that. So I tend to flip that around on a Thursday. Tuesday, we'll do a sort of general aer aerobic or, or conditioning work in the morning. And ideally, say the longer you can leave it, the better in terms of if you're looking at the research. But like I said, I think you've got to be realistic and work within the time frames you've got um, and keep the player interest. And if I said to the players, OK, you've got a football session in the morning and I don't want to see you back in the gym till five o'clock um, I don't think I'll get many turn up so no. I have to uh, I have to try and cater to the needs and, and the demands of the players as well a little bit um, so yeah the, the, the longer the better but be be realistic with, with your players and what time constraints you've got um, again obviously if you've got areas for your player you know if you're, if you're working with a professional club if you're sort of pre-season what we tend to do is uh, you know we might have longer between sessions so we might send them home for a few hours in the afternoon and then get back in later. 
uh, which generally works during pre-season. But in the season, they they just want to get in and out. They won't they want to be coming back and, and driving forwards and backwards. So mm. um, yeah, be realistic. But the longer the better. Yeah, and I think the key question is. Well, I say that the the, the goal of all this is we, we're trying to prepare them for stress. We're gonna we're trying to prepare them to handle the stresses of the game, and we're not just trying to add to that stress. So it's preparing for stress, not adding to stress, and therefore it, it's looking at that program and saying, well, if we have the optimal amount of time to recover, that may that may mean that they're coming in at. As you said, five pm, six pm at night. But one, are they going to show up first thing? And two, is that actually preparing for the stress, or is it giving them more stress? Uh, because they've still got families to go to, and they've still got lives to lead outside. So they might be better off saying, "Well, let's train instead of training at six o'clock. Let's train at one o'clock, or let's train at twelve o'clock after the morning session, uh, or whatever it may be." And then they get home for three o'clock and then they can have a sleep or they can recover properly and they can actually adapt and, and prepare for stress. And I think that's that's something that as a as a question and as a an approach is to, to really look at your program and your, your cycles and say, well, where where can we where can we alleviate some of the stress of the training and, and actually add to some of the recovery as well? Now don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that in all of this we, we go light on them. Um, because you still you've got to train before you recover, uh, but I think that when you're adding to stress just for the sake of it, and, and and you're keeping people back a little bit longer than they need to be kept back, then you know that there are times when you kind of think, you know what, sod the science, let let's get them home and let's let's uh, let's help them recover. You know, does that make sense, Lawrence? Yeah, no, again, backs up a little bit of what I'm saying, and I totally agree with you. And, I say, I think individual players will respond differently to, to the session. So I've got some lads that will train really hard in the morning session, will come in, they'll have a recovery shake and they'll want to go, want to get their, their, their strength session done. Um, and I know if I tell them, no, actually, no, no, you've got to come back in two hours, that by the time they come back, they're going to have lost total interest. Mm. So their effort yeah. level is going to be significantly less. Whereas, you know, they come in from the morning session, um, they're warm, they're pumped up. And they want to come in, they want to get a session done. And I sometimes find I actually get more out of them than I would by making them come back in two hours. Yeah, they may yeah. have a little bit more recovery time. So, um, yes, from, if you look at the rationale and the science, you want them to have that recovery time. But like you said, Brendan, then that may eat up into the recovery time before the next day's session. So, um, you know, it's, it's obviously, look at like you said, look at your training programme and what's, what's coming after that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, that'd be my big point, really. T- totally agree. And, you know, it's it's you. I am totally with you on that. Some people just ready to go after a, what may even appear to be a pretty fatiguing, challenging session. You know, it's amazing what just what the human body can adapt to. And um, from training the MMA fighters, for example, uh, for many many years, you know that there's so many times when just because we've had to, the guys have come in from. Well, even I, I've been actually with them. I've been in the gym with them where they've been doing a 90-minute or even a two-hour pretty solid intensive sparring and technique session in the morning, maybe 10 till 12, and then it's literally straight into the gym. And we're trying to do strength work there. Now, yeah, of course, that's that's not an optimal environment, but over time, they do adapt to that and they, do, and they can produce some serious forces and some serious power in that strength session. And yet that goes contrary to to all of the, the research there. Um, so I think, you know, it's just the re- it's just being realistic really, I think ultimately and uh, and I don't wanna kind of mess around and, and have them come back in two hours time when they've got another session at four o'clock. And they might have another session at, at, at eight o'clock at night or a, or a seven o'clock sort of light roll. They call it a rolling session in, in MMA. So yeah, I think you, you know having a, an understanding of of where the stress is going to come is is critical and just you know com- complementary training as as Mlad and Ivanovic calls it. It's got to be com- It's got to be complementary to the actual purpose and skill base that they're actually training for. Um. Hopefully that helps out. 
uh, gives you some guidance on that, Francis. And um, this one's for you, Lawrence, I'm pleased to say. Um, let's have a look. Special mate. Yeah. Dave, Dave's asked, training on energy, question on energy systems, but a guy preparing for a 33-mile run across the Dolomites, rather him than me, um, so uh, in June. Given that this is endurance in brackets, he will need to be training up in the four to eight minute block. One, am I correct in thinking that the 110, 20 and 30 percent MAS are calculated on the original meters per second assessment and not on the reassessment after each stage? I am assuming this would be the case. Two, for a 33 mile event, would you recommend being nearer the lower or higher end of the four to eight minute zone? Go for it, Lawrence. <laughs> well, <laughs> he's testing me on this one. Uh, to be honest, but I'm glad I had. Uh, I'm glad I saw this question before uh, before you put me on the spot because uh, yeah. first of all, I'd like to look at where the uh, what the Dolomites actually is. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I have a little bit of a think about this one because uh, it would probably would have stumped me about a little bit of a, a thought time to be honest. But um, yeah. Obviously, with, with this sort of distance, um, it is sort of a super endurance, really. Um, mm. And obviously, the way you've got to look at maybe training for this will be similar, I would have thought, with a little bit more um, endurance based than the sort of training for a marathon. Um, so, it was sort of typically, you know, you're going to break this down into sort of different training days. Um, so, it's might depending on his availability, but sort of three or four or four to five sessions per week. Um, so over a four month period, I'll tend to work it in sort of, again, in terms of your periodization, it is sort of monthly cycles. Um, and across your week, I've sort of made some notes here because uh, obviously I don't feel I'll be able to read this off the top of my head, but across your days, um, that might consist of, uh, of one only one interval session. So when we're talking about the match training, I'd say maybe one to two sessions per week, um, you might be able to sort of hit this type of training. Obviously the, the Generally, the consensus with the high intensity stuff is quite generally low in volume. So, if you looked at sort of total distance or, or your volume of your session, it's going to be quite low. And I think one of the, obviously the key components of training for this sort of event is the, the work capacity or the endurance capacity side of it. Um, so, you're going to need to work this type of training in with your longer distance worker as well. Um, so, for example, day one might be your interval sessions. Day two might be a, a sort of a sort of easy run, a long slow distance run. And then, obviously, if you look at uh, obviously my research on the Dolomites, I think it's about three and a half k uh, sort of altitude over hills. So I definitely have some sort of hill session in there. Um, maybe another sort of slower run uh, towards the end of the week, recovery run. And then on, on your sort of fourth or fifth day, I would tend to have sort of what I call a, a, a race run, really, where you're sort of building up your actual mileage and hitting your higher volumes at your, at your sort of race uh, speed. Um, so that would be across my days. Obviously, across in terms of how you build um, your mass into that, into your interval session, sessions, I would tend to work off again your four week blocks. So, for example, week week one, you might be working at 110 percent, um, depending on your interval type. Um, again, that could be your 30s or your 15s, um, and you might want to be sort of working four to six minutes. Um, week two, you might want to crank it up to 120 percent, and then week three, I'll up to 130 percent. And then week four, you might want to have a little bit of an unload period. So you might want to drop your volume. And you could even reassess then where the mass is, because obviously the question there is, um, uh, is it based on their current mass? So you're always going to base this on their, on their current maximum aerobic speed. Like I say, the fourth week, you could even throw in a retest and reassess what their actual mass is, because then this might change your, your distances going into the second block. So at the end of each block, you reassess. And then across the blocks, because it's a, the work capacity component, I would tend to build or increase um, the volume. So, for example, the, f the first block you might be working on four to six minutes, then the second block you might go up to six to eight, and then up to eight to ten minute blocks to really build that volume. Um, but the only thing is, if you're doing that, you've got to be careful. So, if you're building volume, um, a lot of volume on your, your other distances as well, um, you might have to do it in a reverse sort of period where you'll actually increase your intensity over the blocks and sort of reduce the volume as such. So I think it depends on on your overall picture, really, and where your athlete is. But just just be aware there's two different ways you can probably do that. Um, and then I'll say on, on their, their longer days, you want to build up 
sort of the big distances, maybe up to sort of by the end of the period, up to sort of 90% of, of the actual distance they're going to hit within that, uh, within the run. Um, also looked at another, obviously, component you're getting. I said about some, some hill sessions because obviously it's, it's, it's hilly and you're going to be at altitude. One thing we're actually having a little trial with at the moment, which might be worth a, worth a go for, it, for this runner, uh, we're actually trying some oxygen restriction masks. And we're only using them currently with, with injured players, so we've got a player that can't um, sort of train or do anything at a reasonable intensity because he's restricted for his injury. Um, we're using these oxygen restriction masks. So, for example, we're doing a bike session at sort of 60% max heart rate, put him on the, uh, on the mask, you can uh, sort of change the, the predicted altitude so by increasing the altitude, what you're actually doing is you can actually increase his heart rate uh, at sort of lower speeds, lower intensities. So we find this quite a good method actually just to get a bit of like cardio stimulus with our injured players. Now, obviously, because he's going to be training at altitude, you might want to do one of your sessions a week with, with, with using something like this. Again, there's no probably, probably not enough evidence on these masks, but um, it might be something worth considering. And if you do want any information on them, um, I can sort of send that over to you on those masks but um yeah again I'll, i would tend to do it either, either one of those ways so either build your volume across your blocks or for each block keep the intensity the same um and then just build up build up your intensity across each of the four week blocks off or each monthly block so i don't know what you think on that brendan whether you've got any views in terms of training sort of that sort of distance yeah i mean i think um i've not worked with uh any an athlete for that event as such but um I trained a few marathoners and done a little bit of research on it and i think i know we're going to talk about programming for endurance and speed work and stuff like that in a, a future module but short to long approach is, is 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 key really when it comes to managing your volume and intensity towards a, a bigger distance like that and i think it's it's um it's a common myth that they need to have experienced more, a lot more volume than the actual event before the event. Um, so, you know, gradually increasing the volume and, and, and maintaining or keeping the intensity pretty high would be a way that I've sort of trained longer distance runners and, and whatnot in, in the past and it goes back to the build it before you endure it sort of philosophy if you if you know what speed you want to be running at to to complete your event in x many hours then you know what speed you've got to train at and if you can only c complete continue at that speed for you know 40 minutes to start with well that's what you do to start with you don't go for three hours at a lower intensity, you go for maybe 40 minutes or whatever you can do and gradually can increase the number of miles that you're able to, to do that and then complement that with strengthening and single leg work and robustness training because they're going to need a hell of a lot of that. A lot of the capacity and ability to survive something like that is going to come from your strength in your muscles not nothing to do with your cardiovascular system um because and they all work together anyway but uh but i would say a short to long approach with plenty of specific strength and general strength in there um and and the interesting on the on the mask lawrence I, i've um i haven't i wouldn't say i've avoided them but it's it's one of these things that's like a bit of a craze in in um in certain environments and one of those environments is, is MMA where I think the guys buy them because they think that they look like some kind of axe murderer or something like that in them you know like they walk into the cage with a with, a, with an oxygen mask on and they look a bit scary and and one or two of the top guys have worn them and, and so I instantly kind of think mm, I'm a sceptic I'm a natural sceptic before I've really looked into it and uh, I have trained some people who were, were looking at them and, and, and have used them and the research I sort of did on them was more was actually well, it's it's it's, a, it's skeptical whether there's in like enough adaptation, enough time to to get that sort of altitude effect. Um, so 
rather than use the mask, we've had people use oxygen tents where they 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 sleep in the tent with um, with a deprived with a less oxygen, and that's when you actually adapt when you're breathing for longer periods of time with that oxygen. But what you're saying is slightly different in that you're actually doing it for a heart rate response to to can essentially manage injured athletes and and that's quite an interesting use of it i think is that is it, that's that's basically what you're saying isn't it yeah i mean for sure because obviously we're not planning on going to playing at altitude so we're not really using it for, for that purpose um and it's not specifically it's not actually an altitude mask it's just a mask that restricts um the sort of oxygen or the air that you're actually breathing in um and i say like you you said there brendan in terms of like um sort of live higher train low is if you're going to compete how choose the best way um so like you said be, being a sort of exposed to those sort of uh sort of densities in the air at a high level when you're resting and then going down lower to train at higher intensity which makes total sense um i only mentioned it as a, as a tool maybe it might be what you know something you could try in one of your easier rec- you know sessions i'm not saying it's going to work but um if you're doing all the other basics right again is it going to give you much effect then I don't know, but um, it's just something that we're trying to say, like you said, um, it is for a heart rate response more than uh, to get them used to training or competing at altitude. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. That's the sort of main reason, really. And we definitely have seen it when we heart rate them up, stick them on a bike, you know, we can work at a certain resistance, a certain RPM, you give them a mask and you see their heart rate shoot up by yeah. 20, 25 beats per minute. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I can imagine. Um, we can we can obviously get that cardiovascular stimulus without you know putting too much stress on the injury or, or the area, which yeah. works quite well. And um, I'll just before we finish off, guys, if you've got any more questions, to ta- just type them in now. But um, but the other the other thing I don't know, in fact I haven't done any the research on the region, the dolomites as such. But the other one to consider for your preparation there and, and whether it'll fall under your remit on this, Dave, I'm I'm not sure, but from an education perspective is um environmental chambers as well because uh, we we've the heat is a killer and if you if you're competing at, at in a hot environment be it a foreign country or whatever you, preparing for that i think is absolutely critical uh, we had um some, we had some guys compete in the middle east and uh they were competing in a in a stadium, non air conditioned stadium, and the, and the external temperature was forty degrees C, and the internal temperature was even more than that because it was under like the lights and everything like that, just blazing heat, and there was a couple of thousand people in the stadium at the very least, might have even been more, um, and and I think that the work we did in the environmental chamber at the university where we we basically got them doing sessions in the chamber just to as much as anything psychologically as well as physiologically prepare them for what they're going to be able how they're going to be able to respond to that the breathing the fatigue levels that is that is critical and um, I think we, we've seen probably better effects that than any sort of altitude type stuff just from the environmental side because it's um it's an edge that they can get over there come competition there for sure uh, but but don't know how that relates to the the uh, super endurance event that you're talking about and and what not and what level your athletes at as well uh, whether that'll be a defining factor or not but um, something to consider yeah I think I think my other thing there as well when you're talking about the, the different environment and just generally really is that you need to be looking at building some sort of good hydration and sort of uh, nutrition strategies for the event obviously being that sort of long in duration um, especially say if it is a different climate um, that has the sort of you want to build into their training, you know, how, how they're taking off fluids and if you're going to start incorporating sort of energy gels and things like that, um, just to build that in as well with, with your training program. I think that's something you shouldn't overlook. Absolutely, yeah, 100%. Um, well, we haven't got any other questions, Lawrence, but um, anything else that you kind of want to bring up? Anything that's on your mind, SNC wise or coaching wise this week? Uh, no, I think I'll say we covered a lot of the weekend and there's obviously a lot of good uh, good topics to come up over the next few weeks, so I don't want to give away too, too many of my nuggets too early. <laughs> um, I'll keep some things in the locker for the for next few weeks, but um, 
no, I think just just carry on the good work, guys. And if you do have any questions, uh, you can always contact us via Facebook or, or email. Perfect. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we've got plenty more to share with you over the next few weeks. Uh, what what I would say is that if you haven't seen it already, I've I've put two follow up workshops out on the Facebook group. <clears throat> And also, I sent an email out with the details. Uh, the first one's on the 18th of April. That is with Duncan French, Dr. Duncan French, and that's going to be on applied coaching. So Dunk's going to cover a lot of the differential learning stuff, a lot of the um, stuff that the concepts that the English Institute of Sport have been looking at on motivation and engagement and and as well as the actual cues, key cues for movement and strength and, and things like that and implicit learning and constraints based theories of motor learning uh, so that that is genuinely going to be awesome and I know Duncan very very well his workshops never disappoint he's an engaging guy in his own right but he always brings cutting edge information he's, he's, he's bang up today he's, he's really on it um, so that's going to be a fantastic workshop that's at Yorkshire County Cricket and then myself and Dave Hember are going to do a, a two-day barbell and gym-based strength and, strength and power workshop on the 13th and 14th of June. And I'm really looking forward to that one as well because not only are we going to cover basic barbell training and, and really get into detail of how to coach these key lifts. Um, so you're going to learn you know, how to get people doing stiff leg deadlifts in seconds without ever having to revisit that technique, how to get people squatting really well in the, the first session, teach people how to do hang cleans and hang snatches in five minutes and give them techniques and warm-ups that they can groove that technique in as well and never have to really go back to it apart from refining techniques. We're going to cover all of that. But we're also going to go into power training, how to get explosiveness in the gym and how to get the transfer as well. So... I'm really looking forward to, to sharing some in-depth gym-based stuff uh, on the 13th, 14th of June with Dave. Uh, so I've put the information out to both of them and I really would encourage you to get yourself along to that. I know it's a bit of a trek for some of you, uh, but if you can, make a weekend out of it. Get up, see myself, see Dave, catch up with people. It really will bring you on as well on, on those two areas. And they're massively subsidised for, for anyone on the mentorship programme. Uh, we're basically just covering facilities and making sure that you guys get a, a great, great weekend out of them. Um, so do take advantage. And we've only got 20 spaces on both. And I know we've already got basically 10 or 12 people on both of them already. So don't mess around on that one, guys. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it. Lawrence, what have you got on the rest of the week, mate? Uh, yeah, just sort of building into another game now. Obviously, we've had a, a busy schedule this week with Saturday, Tuesday, both being away up your neck of the woods. And mm, uh, yeah. now back Taylor into a home game at the weekend against Huddersfield. So, um, yeah, more, more getting around, sort of tapering off and hopefully getting a result of the weekend. Nice. Yeah, well, good luck with it. Cheers, Brent. And we will be back, Lawrence and I, next Wednesday with our next module and uh, look forward to sharing a lot more information with you then. So, Lawrence, have a great week, mate. Thanks, Brendan. Speak to you soon, guys. And thanks again for listening in, guys. That's great. Thanks.